So hello everybody. So I'm Nicolas Thierry, so the guy interested in this presentation. So I found this option. So I hope it uh, will not disturb you too much. So uh, first of all, of course, I want to thank the organizers because it's a pleasure to discuss here today with you about novel laser sources for ultrafast spectroscopy. So when we discuss with Osho and Katerina at some point, uh, I think since I'm more specialized in uh, mid IR OPCPL sources. This is mainly uh, the subject of this talk. So, of course, I have to thank uh, all the people involved in uh, the development at first light of these sources. So we are like uh, running like a small lab. So uh, all of us, uh, we uh, we work together in order to to develop the best sources uh, we can. So there are also other people that I not named there, all the electronicians and the optomechanical guy uh, that are helping quite a lot in order to uh, to do um, to do these sources. So um, first of all, here is the outline of the talk. So I will discuss why do we need mid IR sources and what are the necessity or the specs you need if you want, for example, to do spectroscopy or if you want to use these sources as a driver for secondary sources, like when uh, you are using the I harmonic generation process. After, I will discuss how can we make such sources like uh, high rep rate, high average power sources, and I will discuss the optical parametric amplification that is the main mechanism responsible for these sources. So, uh, and uh, after that, after identifying this, uh, this mechanism, I will discuss the key technologies that are now available in the market and that help us to develop these sources. So, after that, I will discuss a bit more uh, into details, uh, how do we make such sources and, for example, one of the most important things to me is the fact that we self-seed uh, the OPA with a uh, generate uh, white light that is generating with the pump uh, pulse that is a picosecond pump pulse. Then uh, I will discuss about funny crystals that I uh, that are the periodically poor lithium niobate that are maybe not so much known uh, in the community. And of course, to finish, I will uh, show you some example of a PCPA we developed uh, in our team. I will start with uh, one that is at fixed wavelengths at three micron, uh, that is four cycle for optical cycle, and it is CEP stable. Then I will show you that you can have also in the same system a tunable source from 1.4 to 1.8 micron, and then the, the idler beam that corresponds to uh, this uh, wavelength, so from 2.3 to 4 micron. And then here, what is funny is we can go from 50 to 500 frames per second, and also both signal and idler arm can be uh, CEP stable, not at the same time, but you can have both. And then uh, I want also to uh, show you that we can have at the output of OPCPAs something that is already short. And uh, here I will present you uh, briefly a two micron source with less than a two optical cycle and also uh, CEP stable. So now, why do we need uh, mid IR sources? So the first application of uh, the mid IR wavelength is for spectroscopy. And this graph to me, uh, represent quite well, so I can move my head. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, this graph represents quite well uh, what, why it's important to have um, wavelengths in this range. Because you can see here, all these molecules here, uh, they have raw vibrational or vibrational signature in this range of wavelengths. That means if you want to understand the mechanism of vibration and raw vibrational, um, on these molecules, you need to probe them with these wavelengths. And if you want to do that, if you want to see dynamics inside these molecules, you will need to go and to get sources that are available and that can uh, resolve the time scale of this uh, vibration, so typically hundreds of femtosecond. So why they vibrate? It's simply because you can see why you can, sorry, probe them at this wavelength, since we can, for example, see here different kind of bounds that, are, that have their signature in this spectral range. So this is the first application, the, let's say the most obvious one, spectroscopy in the mid-IR. And there is another one that is the harmonic generation. And I think you all know the basic mechanism of harmonic generation. And if you look at that, what is really nice, it's after this tunnel ionization at the peak of uh, the electric field here, 
you can uh, have uh, the electron that is accelerated in the continuum through with the electric field. And when the electric field changes sign, the kinetic energy that is accumulated uh, during the propagation of this electron in the continuum, um, this electron can come back and you can have radiative emission. And this quadratively uh, depends on the wavelength. That means more you extend the wavelength, more time you have to accelerate your electron in the continuum. So more kinetic energy you can gain. And this gives you the cutoff energy and you can really extend the cutoff energy up to the KV regime. This has been uh, demonstrated. And this is what I show in the next slide. And what is, uh, what is good here, you can see that at 800 nanometer, you have roughly uh, photons that are emitted with this ionic generation mechanism of 250 eV, 100 eV. Then you move at 1.3 micron, you see you can already uh, get access to 400 eV photons. That is really quite good. You have access to the carbon K8. That means you can probe uh, all the molecules, for example, with carbon. And then if you move at 2 micron, it opens you this uh, water window. That is uh, something that is uh, in uh, the range where you have carbon and oxygen uh, K uh, edge. Uh, that means all uh, the, the molecule that contains carbon and oxygen, basically all the molecules that matters for living species, they will absorb more than water in this uh, wavelength range. That means you can probe them in water. And that's why this region is really interesting. And then if you move, for example, at 4 micron, so in helium, I didn't say that before, but if you move to uh, 4 micron, you can see that you can extend the cutoff up to more than a kV. And this is quite nice because that means in a conventional lab where you can generate the ammonics, you can have access to these uh, atoms and you can be sensitive to these atoms. And these atoms, for example, are responsible for the ultrafast demagnetization if you uh, look at this uh, phenomenon in uh, solids. Of course, it's not perfect. If you use longer wavelengths to drive your high ionic generation process, your probability to recombination, if you look at this quantumly in this process, uh, is quite low because you uh, thread your wave function, the part of the wave function that is in the continuum, you spread it a lot. And to come back and to have uh, constructive interferences with the core ion, the part of the wave function stay in the core ion, you decrease quite a lot, the efficiency, and this scale uh, with lambda minus five minus six. That means if you want to have a source using three, four micron photons, you need to have high rep rate in order to give enough flux to do experiment uh, with, this, um, with this source. So this was two examples, but you have way more examples that I can, uh, why do you need uh, mid IR sources with high rep rate. The high rep rate is uh, really important, for example, if you do culture experiment, because in this reaction microscope experiment, you have one event per laser shot. So, more laser shots you have, more information of what happened in your system you will have. So, it's really important to have high rep rate. If you mix high rep rate with mid IR broadband fuel cycle, for example, or mid IR um, sources, you can really work, and this is what you would need if you want to do 2D spectroscopy and vibrational 2D spectroscopy. Then I spoke about these two guys, and if you mix, for example, mid IR plus CP stability, this is how you can generate isolated attosecond pulses. And then, of course, if you mix these three, this is kind of sources that are quite important for attosecond science for this uh, community. So if I summarize what we need, what, what is needed, for the experiment I described just before. You want high rep rate, so you want up to 100 of kilohertz. Then you want high energy per pulse. So if you want to use this source as a driver, you, more, you need more than 100 of microjoule per pulse. That means you need high average power sources. Then if you want to have good temporal resolution, and if you want to have a good intensity, you need extremely or short pulses, so few optical cycle pulses. Then you need this, range of wavelengths from one to 10 micron, this would be perfect to do uh, what you have to do with these sources. For example, spectroscopy, this is nice if you can go to 10 micron. And of course, if you have super short pulses, it's really, it's really good if you have CP uh, control also. That means you can control the electric field under the envelope of the pulse. Now, how do we do that? So we are using uh, the optical parametric amplification process that has already been, been described by our show this morning. And uh, um, here is the equation. It's still funny to see my face interested in the video. 
up if I move there. So you are the this this is <laughs> this is a, uh, just a polarization vector, and you see you already heard quite a lot, and you will I think guess I guess you will hear quite often during the week about that. What is important in this? I will discuss about this k two uh, in e square. So here is the conservation of energy in case of OPA. You have also conservation of phase, and I will describe that a bit uh, after. But let's speak about a particular case of uh, uh, optical parametric amplification. It's when you have the, the possibility to transfer energy from a high frequency pump, quite intense, to a lower frequency, quite weak seed. Here it's named signal. So for that, you will have, if you want to preserve the, the, the energy, you will have to generate uh, nylar uh, photons also. And uh, this effect is mainly dependent about this, uh, is mainly dependent on the chi 2 of the medium where you will have this uh, nonlinear process. Also, it depends on the incident waves, the pump and the seed. And uh, you have to feel all this condition about the phase velocity or group velocity, if you have enough bandwidth of the group velocity in order to have the decay that is equal to zero. This is the conservation of momentum. So if you match that, you can have an optical parametric amplifier. What you have to know, it's K2, it's a tensor. So it depends on the three coordinates uh, in space. So what we do usually, we reduce it to a scalar quantity that is called the effective nonlinearity that depends on this uh, um, phase matching condition, for example, and also on the material you're using. So but most of the time we speak about uh, the effective. So higher is the effective, higher will be uh, the nonlinear effect. This is a... Uh, I think what I wanted to say on that because uh, uh, you were quite a lot about this process. Then, what is interesting in this process? The fact is, when you are using uh, OPCPAs or OPAs, because an OPCPA is just a, uh, an OPA with a chirp pulse, you have no energy storage. That so means, compared to laser, you have low thermal load. And this is quite important if you want to develop high average power sources, for example, but it's also uh, good if you want if you want to avoid destroying uh, your crystal, for example. The fact also is you have high gain in a single pass that makes your source quite compact. This gain can be tunable. That means changing the phase matching condition, changing the material where you will generate um, uh, your frequency, for example, or amplify it. Uh, this makes tunable your source tunable compared to laser that are fixed compared to the gain, you know, the medium gain way, what you're using. Sorry, I'm not clear. Then, the amplification can also be very broad, so you can natively amplify extremely short pulses up to a few optical cycles. Then, with this three-wave mixing you have, you have a current process that drives you a nitro beam with passive CP stabilization. That means the electric field under the envelope can be controlled. And then, since you seed and you are using a nonlinear process to generate a seed, you have an extremely good temporal contrast. So then, why do we use CPA? Mainly, it's to adapt the seed duration to the pump one in order to transfer um, the energy from the pump to the seed. So the approach we have in our team is we try to make the source as simple as possible because if it's simple, it can be robust. So we try to have like bulk dispersion technique. We use an LPDF to control the dispersion piece of glass and uh, to compress. Most of the time we use windows or chirp mirrors. Then uh, what is uh, nice, it since we have this passive CP stabilization, we actively stabilize it using this OPDF, that is a dazzler. And also what is, I think, uh, really important when you develop OPCPA is the fact to have a system. That means you need to be able to understand what happened in your system, and you need to look at your system at each pulse of your system of, of what happened. Like that, when you collect information about each pulses, you can really have a good understanding and you can make your system uh, quite stable and robust. So we call it OPCPA system. It's not just optical component on the table. So also, of course, you have uh, some uh, limitation. So the, the first one is the fact that since you are in femto or picosecond regime, you have significant uh, third order effects in crystals like SPM or KLNs. Then you have also an efficient two-photon absorption, so you have to be careful on that. 
Uh, also, since if you're using more than a millijoule or tens of millijoule of beam, it starts to be quite hard to propagate them in air. So you have to propagate them in under control atmosphere. It can be vacuum, it can be helium, but you need to uh, be uh, careful about the filamentation that can destroy uh, your pores. Then most of the crystal also, or most of the material where you will go uh, for amplification, they have been tested with nanosecond sources. So since you're using picosecond or femtosecond sources, um, sometimes their damage threshold is not known. So you have to be careful and to do your own test. Then since you have, uh, you want high average power and high rep rate, also, Due to accumulation effect, the fact that uh, the, the, the pulse coming after one can still feel the uh, physical effect of the previous one. That means if you excite a system, if it has no time to relax, the second pulse can damage your sample by just simply, for example, ionizing your system. So you have to be careful about this accumulation effect that depends quite a lot on the rep rate. And due to uh, the high average power, any uh, absorption due to residual or parasitic effects can lead to it, the system, so that can give you a thermal lens, but it can also clamp uh, the gain. So you have to be careful to look at all this uh, parasitic effect and to be sure that they will not be problematic. So how also, an important point, it seems you want to develop something that is a source, I am working in, uh, even if it's a private lab, it's still industry. So you want to have something that is super robust. So for now, a few years, a couple of years, you have really available sources that are extremely uh, stable. So it's ethabium YAG laser sources. What is really cool, and since it's these uh, lasers are industrial grade lasers, they are turnkey system. So they are extremely stable. Their rep rate, it's going up to hundreds of kilohertz, even megahertz. The pulse duration of this pulse can natively be uh, around the peak of second. That is really good to reach the intensity you need to start uh, uh, the nonlinear process we just speak before about. And then the average power to me is it's insane. They can go up to 2.5 kilowatts. It, it's this amount of uh, power is really amazingly high. And uh, just remember that when you are in, in the lab with milliwatt level, you can burn your skin. So that's why you use them to cut piece of metal. Uh, also, there are some limitation, of course. So the pulse duration, you cannot go down to hundreds of uh, femtosecond. And then since it's a laser, the, the wavelength is fixed at 1030 nanometer. So if you want to move, that's why you want to use OPAs in order to uh, up convert or then convert these uh, frequencies. Now, we also at FastLife developed some uh, technologies. And I think the one you know is this Paul Shaper, that is a Nakusto optic dispersive uh, filter. I don't remember the P now, but anyway, it's uh, an LPDF. And this LPDF now, so this dazzler that can control the dispersion of your pulse, is, is working at 100 kHz and from uh, 1.3 to 2 micron. It's typically with the wavelength range of the signal or the seed we are working uh, with. How it is working? Uh, I think maybe some of you you know, but I, I, I just wanted with a short slide. Oh, that's good. So there is no um, animation uh, when you are using uh, this. Uh, this uh, Okay, no problem. The fact it's you enter with a stretch pulse here on the ordinary axis. And what is nice, it's you can transfer with a dazzler. The goal is to transfer information from a, an acoustic wave to an optical one. So what you will do with your acoustic wave, you will generate a grating of diffraction and you will diffract portion of your beam. And this diffraction will occur at different position in the crystal. So for example, here you have uh, positive dispersion, and you can apply negative dispersion second order in the dazzler. So you will diffract the red first, and you use a biorefringence of the material. You will diffract at the middle of the green and the blue at the end. So that means on this extraordinary, extraordinary axis, you will uh, diffract the beam with a negative dispersion. That means the beam that has been diffracted at the end is compressed. You can also play, of course, with the amplitude, of this acoustic uh, wave. So that means you will also play uh, with the amplitude of the optical wave. And then you can also go for higher orders. Here is just an example with second one, but you can go third, fourth, fifth order. 
And this is really uh, good if you want to be able to uh, be close to the Fourier transform limit uh, at the output of your system. Then we also, as I said, uh, if you want to do a system, you need to develop devices that can see uh, clearly the, um, the, the pulses, each pulse. So we have synchronization. You need, of course, this is kind of master clock, but the funniest is maybe this one. It's named Big Brother because this Big Brother can see everything. So we record each laser shots and we do uh, some um, operation on it with an FPGA and we can have access to information of each laser shot. It's the same for the CP when we measure the fringe with uh, uh, the, the, the fringes. Uh, we, yes, we like to have 2Z, uh, 2Z in uh, all our um, system, Dazzler, fringes, Modda, it's the spectrometer also we are using, but the fringes can measure single shot manner of the CP uh, noise. And we also have this second harmonic frog in order to be able to measure the pulse duration of the, of, uh, the pulses uh, from one to five micro. So there is another important question. It's uh, this, that means what I show you is we will use optical parameter complexification. We have some key technology like the pump, some device that we develop in our, uh, in our labs. But what is uh, the important mechanism at the heart of this system, this OPCPA system? This is the seed. So you generate a white light using the picosecond laser beam. And this is really nice because you will have uh, something that is uh, optically stable. That means since you're using the same pulse to pump the OPAs and to generate the seed, they are completely, they are optically synchronized. How do we do that? So we are using the Kerr effect. What is the Kerr effect? It's the fact that you uh, modify the index of your medium with the intensity. So if you reach a beam that is intense enough, you can modify uh, the index. And since the laser um, intensity, especially in homogeneous, you are dealing with Gaussian beam, so it's higher in the center compared to the edge. You will result with a, a phase, you will acquire a phase that is different in the center than in the GA. And this results in a, a positive N2 and gives you, with the medium, sorry, with a positive N2, this will give you a lens effect. So you will self-focus the beam. And uh, the critical power where the self-focusing effect Counterbalance the self diffraction is given by this equation. That means at some point you will have competition between these two. And this is this critical power you want to reach in order to have this self focusing effect. And then what will happen? It's uh, as it is described uh, here at some point of the propagation inside uh, this, uh, this medium, the beam will collapse. So this effect will not lead to a singularity because ionization in the medium will counterbalance the self-focusing effect with the free electrons and you, it will lead to a plasma defocusing. And you will have a competition in between these two, two forces and that's how you have a filament that propagates inside your medium. And at the end, because you will have, of course, some losses due to absorption mainly, you will have diffraction and uh, you, it will end your filamentation process. So using this filament, what is important for us, it's the instantaneous care effect. So what will happen with this instantaneous uh, care effect? It's you will have a spectral phase here due to this SPM. So we have this uh, care effect, as I said, and what will happen? That means that lower frequency they are creating at the leading edge of the pulse and the higher frequency at the trailing edge. And this effect can be, uh, can be seen as positive chirp. And this is the main effect responsible from the fact that from a super weak, narrow and picosecond beam, but not weak, uh, sorry, intense, but uh, with a really uh, uh, narrow band pulse, you can generate something that is weak, but extremely uh, broad band. You can also, in the case when you have a soliton that propagates, this is what I put there here, you can have a delay Raman response, and this will be more responsible for the fact that you will, um, um, uh, you will, sorry, uh, you will transfer energy so from uh, higher frequency to lower one. Uh, but here, well, I will mainly speak about that. Uh, as you know, why it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, we have a positive dispersion due to this uh, SPM effect. The fact is most of the material, they have positive dispersion in the visible range, but in the mid IR, they have negative dispersion. It's called anormal dispersion. So what is uh, also nice in this process, it's you will have positive chirp due 
to the uh, creation of this new frequency and negative one due to propagation of these new frequencies inside the medium. So you can, at the end of the process, when you go out of the crystal, you can uh, approximate the fact that you have a Fourier transform limit duration. So what a spectrum can look like? So if you generate with this 1030 uh, narrow but intense uh, pulse, you can have a spectrum. So here, all the frequencies, uh, all the wavelengths uh, below 1.2 are blocked by a filter. But what is nice here to see is you can extend your uh, your continuum up to 2.4 micro. It's it's a normal scale. It's not a, it's not a logarithmic scale. So after you select the bandwidth, the spec, yeah, spectral bandwidth, so the frequency you want to amplify, and with the optical parameter amplification process, you can do uh, this amplification. So here you can see here the filament that propagates, and why you can see it, it's due to uh, this uh, ionization. Now, uh, another point that I think is funny is the crystal we're using and we're building uh, in the lab. I think you know that you have this uh, phase matching condition. I cannot move more than that. No, I can go. So, and there, uh, conservation of energy, so fission of photons, signal and idler. And then you have here the phase condition. I, I add this term and you will see after why. I think you know that you have the type one phase condition. This is when the signal and idler wave, they have the same polarization. Most of the time the pump polarization crossed um, uh, the, the, the polarization of uh, the signal and idler. In type two uh, phase matching, you have signal and idler and they have cross polarization. And you have another kind of uh, uh, um, phase matching condition that is type zero. And this type zero, this is when the signal idler and the pump, they have the same polarization. And this is also a, uh, named crazy phase matching. So how, uh, how this is working is the fact that you are here the domain and what these domain are. So what you will do here, it's you have a negative D effective here. Uh, this means a chi two is negative and a positive chi two here. And the effective as we described just before, because the, the value we speak uh, are easier and this is what we use in daily life. But then what will happen? It's if you want to match the uh, group velocities of uh, the seed and your pump inside the crystal, this uh, group velocity will depend on the, the, the domain, on the period of your periodically pulled uh, crystal. And what is cool is if you use fan out crystal, for example, you can change the period there by moving the crystal, by translating the crystal. So this is how you do phase matching with this kind of crystal. And if you look at the, the numbers that are here, what is crazy here is, as we said before, higher is this D effective, uh, higher will be the nonlinear process. In this crystal, like for example, periodically poor lithium niobate, it's around 15 picometer per volt. And that's four times higher than the normal buck lithium niobate for the same uh, frequencies, that is around four picometer per volt. And I give you uh, the BBU that we all use in the lab, that is the nonlinear crystal that we all deal with it's two picometer per volt. That means these crystals are crazy uh, non-linear. So that's why we are using them. The problem is you cannot upscale their size up to infinite. Anyway, since I hope uh, you understand the basic mechanism and tools you need to build OPCPA sources, now I will start to record to, to speak about the sources we develop in our team. So, I will first uh, discuss about this uh, 100 kilohertz media driver at 3.2 micron that has been developed for Eli apps. That is maybe, you know, it's a, um, a facility in Hungary to do attosecond science. And it's centered at three micron. It's uh, around 40 femtosecond pulse, 15 watts. That means uh, this value at 100 kilohertz and it's CEP stable. Here, if you look at what it looks like, so you can see that you have the control rack. Here is the pump laser, the ETRBM pump laser. This is a compressor because this is the, the industrial box, if you want, from Trump here. And you add a compressor after that in order to go from 200 picosecond roughly to a few, uh, to one picosecond. Then we have our front end. So this is our box front end uh, stage that we call booster. And here, since you need to be under um, dry conditions, so uh, dry air, in order to avoid absorption of your three micron beam, uh, we put all the diagnostic uh, inside uh, these um, boxes. 
And after, uh, just to, to, to present you, so what we do, we generate a white light uh, with this one picosecond pump. As I said, we take a portion of the, pill, of the pulse to generate the white light with the mechanism I described before. And we here have a spectrum that extends uh, to uh, 2.4 micron, but we try to place the main part of the spectrum at 1.55 because we will want to generate 3.2 micron, and this is the idler beam when you do uh, OPA with one, uh, one micron and 1.55 micron. Then we use a dazzler uh, in order to control the dispersion, to stretch the seed, to match the pulse duration of the pump. But also what is nice with the dazzler, as I said, you can also apply a um, higher order of dispersion, so you can pre-compensate the third order. There is no material with negative third order, but with the dazzler, you can put negative third order. Also, uh, if you want to have a more or less bandwidth, just ask to diffract more or less bandwidth, so your seed will have more or less bandwidth. So this is quite nice if you want to go from uh, narrow pulses to uh, broad pulses in the same system, what I will uh, describe in the, uh, in the system right after this one. And then uh, uh, applying with a feedback loop, when you measure your CP noise, you can have CP control of, um, of your pulse. So to give you an example, we go, with 25 microjoule of pump, uh, it's one nanojoule. I think it's more than 10, uh, 10 hundreds of picojoule. Anyway, uh, it's quite weak. So we have high gain uh, stage here. So it's a, a periodically polyethylene niobate fan out as described just before. And we have this spectrum at 3.2, and this will come with passive uh, CP stabilization. Then it's, it's an amplifier. So we had amplifi amplification stages. So here you have three after this DFG stage. So the second one is again with a PPLN and after we use a lithium niobate bulk because we cannot have a crystal that are big enough. Uh, these crystals are extremely hard to make and to produce. So uh, they cannot uh, be more than a few millimeter aperture. So we go with lithium niobate. And at the end, we have this spectrum that is quite broad that can support uh, 36 or 38 femtoseconds for your unit. We measure the pulse duration, of course, and uh, using this uh, second harmonic flow, we measure 40 femtosecond pulses with a quite, it's not perfect, but flat phase, and the pulse construct is uh, quite good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say that we compress this pulse, sorry, uh, with 20 millimeter of silicon. So this is what is nice uh, in the mid infrared. It's by selecting the material you go through, you can have positive or negative dispersion. So you can really uh, play with, um, you can stretch or compress uh, your pulses. Then what is important? So, so I have no animation there, but anyway, so you have the near field profile and what is really also nice with OPCPA, it's uh, if you do well the work in the OPA, you keep basically uh, the beam profile of the pump. And since the pump is really nice, you can have extremely a nice beam profile. This is a near field at the output of uh, the beam, of the system, sorry, at three micron. So you can see in the near field, if you focus down, you have the far field. So the far field is quite clean. And what you can do, you can measure the strain ratio. What is the strain ratio? It's simply the fact that you measure the far field and you do a Fourier transform, a special Fourier transform of your near field, and it gives you a computed far field. You compare what you should have, if your beam is perfect, compared to what you measure, you do the ratio and it gives you a ratio. Here is 0.82. Give, it's, it's, it's quite a good value. It gives you uh, M square, it's correspond to M square if you want, about 1.3. So uh, the beam is quite nice at the output. We have a, a, a good pulse duration, few optical cycle. I come back on the right part of the screen. And then what is important, as I said, you want something that is uh, with high rep rate, but you want also stability during the whole measurement of your experiment. So the beam should not move. So here, just to show that during eight hours, the beam is not moving, we have a good stability. And this, this is due to two things, mainly the fact that the pump is uh, extremely stable. And if you deal uh, uh, well with all the, the thermal load you have inside your system, you can also have something that is stable since you don't store uh, power inside the OPAs. Then let's speak about the CEP. So what is important here in the CEP is the fact that, uh, you know, the, the definition, uh, the offset between the optical phase and the maximum of the wave envelope in, in an optical uh, pulse. That means basically you control the electric field under the envelope. And this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is nice since you have it for free. You have a passive CP stabilization. I will show you how 
you have this passive CPA stabilization and also how we can uh, stabilize it using a feedback loop. So here we have conservation of energy in OPS, but you have also conservation of the phase. That means the phase of the pump minus the phase of the seed and the idler is equal, is equal pi over two. So that means the phase, the phase of the idler is the beam that interests us here. This is the phase of the pump minus the phase of the seed or signal uh, minus pi over two. If I uh, remind you, so we split, you have part of the pump beam that is going to pump the OPA. Here there is a DFG stage, what we call DFG stage. Uh, definition can uh, change if you discuss with other people, but anyway, and you generate using this white light generation uh, mechanism in a YAG, uh, and you go through a dazzler with this continuum, and you, you generate, you control the dispersion, and what you want, you want to be center and amplify something at 155. You will generate at 3.1 micron a beam, the hydro beam, and the phase uh, can be uh, stabilized and is passively stabilized using this mechanism, because if you inject if you inject this phase of the seed, what is the phase of the seed? The phase of the seed is the phase of the pump, since you use the pump to generate the seed, plus an offset, because you can see here that this arm and this arm, they don't experience the same material, the same beam pass, so you have an offset, but it's it's something that is uh, a constant. And then you have the pass difference, you have an interferometer, so two, two arms can move differently from each other. And you have this uh, term that is a nonlinear phase. So what you do is if you inject this uh, inside this equation, you have simply the fact that the phase of the idler is a constant minus these two terms. That means uh, the fluctuation uh, mainly due to, uh, this is a slow drift, it's between the, it can be thermal, it can be some movement, but it's quite slow. This is in between the two arms and you have this uh, intensity uh, uh, due uh, to, uh, to, to phase coupling inside uh, the, when you generate your white light. And this you cannot really do uh, much. Uh, you can just hope to have a good uh, pump uh, stability. And this is what most of the time we have using the Italian pump uh, yeah, laser. So, and after, how, what do you, what do, you do? So, you use a 2FF interferometer in order to measure your fringe. When you do that, you collect this fringe, single shot manner using a fringe detector named fringes here, and you feed the dazzler with information collected by the fringes. And after what the dazzler will do, you can modify the phase of your acoustic wave in order to transfer this information to uh, the uh, optical wave. And just playing with that, moving like that, you can correct uh, this slow drift that we just picked uh, before. So to give you an example, this is what we have without feedback loop. So this is a passive uh, CEP stabilization. And when you add the feedback loop, you can see that your phase start to be, uh, that stay at the target value here, zero, uh, during quite a long time. Here we have eight hours measurement. You can see if we, we need to zoom on it in order to be uh, to see uh, this, it's 65 milliradians. And what is also nice with OPCPA is if you do measurement during eight hours, that is typical day of work, uh, you have three billion shots that uh, have been here recorded. And just to give you ideas, 65 milliradians at 3.2 micron, this is uh, um, in, term, in time, if you want, um, it's 110 attosecond uh, resolution. So it's still uh, quite impressive to see um, with this OPA, OPA process, you have DFG stabilization, and by uh, just playing with uh, something that can correct the slow drift, you can reach uh, this value. Now, since you have a good CP stabilization uh, during eight hours, that means also your power is uh, quite stable. So here you can see during 12 hours, we have uh, power uh, that is uh, 15 watts in this system, and uh, really nice, quite close to the pump value. Can be sometimes even better since you have um, uh, in the OPA stage, you have saturation effect. So if I summarize here, you can see 3.2 micron, 50 watts, we measure for uh, optical cycle and the CP noise is around uh, 65 uh, milliradians. Now I will speak about another uh, kind of uh, OPA that is tunable from 1.4 to, to 4 micron roughly with a gap uh, in the middle, of course. Uh, and then uh, we can tune it from 50 to 4, 500 femtoseconds. It goes up to 20 watts. I didn't say before what I was doing because I was uh, 
in the previous uh, OPA, it was uh, OPCPA, it was pumping with 200 watt system. Here it's the same, we pump with 200 watt uh, system. And it, it is a uh, CP stable. So if I show you uh, what uh, happened, yeah, I, I draw here a uh, Swiss Army knife because this is how we call it. Since you have almost everything you want is accessible in this system. So if you look at this system, it's uh, quite compact. So we have the rack with all the electronics to uh, and the amplifier here. Here is the pump laser and here is your PCPA uh, system. So it's 1.5 by 1.5 meter. So we have three modes, uh, HAG mod in order to uh, you to use this system as a driver for high harmonic generation. At 1.70, we have 20 watt, a bit more. And at three micron or one three micron, we have six watt. These modes, we have CP stabilization on both arm. And then you can have spectroscopy mode. So it's 100 femtosecond uh, time resolution in this range of wavelengths. And we can also have a narrow band to, if you want to increase your spectral resolution of 500 femtosecond in the same wavelength, wavelength range. Now, if I uh, show you what, why, and uh, how we get uh, this CP stabilization in both signal and idle beams, arms, sorry, it's the fact that I show you how you can have it at three micron, but how you can have it at 1.8 micron going with the same pump laser. So basically what we do is we use the same white light generation and we will double the white light. That means instead of having uh, phi in the, the phase of uh, the, sorry, it's here, on the seed, you will have two phi. And you do the same for the pump, you double the pump. So instead of having phi, you have two phi because you pump your OPA or DFD stage at 515 nanometer. And then this is how at the end you have a constant uh, phase. And if you do your DFG in your last OPA, this is what we do, that is pump at 1030. If you use another white light, you have DFG in the three micron and CP stabilization in the three micron. After again, all OPAs uh, and OPAs, and you uh, evaluate how you want to manage your power in order to uh, reach uh, the decent amount of uh, power you want at the output of your system. What is cool there? It's uh, when you play and if you want to have such a tunable uh, system and uh, if you want to play from uh, long pulse duration to short pulse duration, first of all, uh, you cannot open the system to play with phase matching. So you need to have phase matching. So you the orientation or the position of the crystal is uh, controlled with the computer, of course. You control the optical delay since your pulse are sharp, depending on the wavelengths you want to amplify, you have to move them. Then you have the dazzler because depending on the frequency you want to amplify, you have to adapt your dispersion because the dispersion uh, is, uh, has to be different. But in a way, the absolute value of the dispersion should be the same in the OPA in order to reach the same pulse duration. But since the material, uh, you know that the dispersion is different compared uh, for, for different wavelengths. If you go through the same materials, you have to adapt it in order to have the same pulse duration in the OPA. So this, we do it with the dazzler. And after uh, you have chirp mirrors in order to, uh, to uh, sorry, I have a phone call. You have different pulse uh, duration. Uh, sorry, what I said, no, you have wedges uh, in order to compress uh, the idle beam. And uh, we use chirp mirrors to compress the signal. What is really interesting, it's the fact that we can also control the bandwidth by filtering it with the dazzler. I mean, depending on the bandwidth you want to use, 50 or 55 or 50 second, this you control it with the dazzler. After you also have to control the dispersion and this is the, we did it with, uh, with the dazzler. So some results here, I show you uh, what we have in the signal. So here it's tunable, here you have the power, the wavelengths. What you can see is we can reach 20 uh, watts a bit less in the uh, yeah, in the, the outer part of uh, the tunable uh, tunability. Uh, then, of course, there you have uh, the, the idler corresponding to this frequency, a bit less power because here the idler is coming only from the last OPA. Uh, so you can see we have tunability. There uh, we have water absorption. That's why, for example, this spectrum is quite uh, structured. If you look at the signal power and the idler power during the 14 hours of this measurement, it's uh, really stable. Again, quite close to the pump value on both signal and idler beam, but this makes sense. 
And after what is funny, I don't know if you look here about uh, the, the bandwidth of the pulses. So here it's like 100 frames per second resolution. In here it's 400 frames per second resolution. You see, it's simply what you did. You asked the dazzler to cut uh, in the bandwidth. And then if you will go to the HAG mode by controlling uh, the CP also, you can have 20 watts. It's a bit less than 50 frames per second uh, at 1.75. And that's uh, three micron, you have six watts in the system. So uh, again, uh, we measured uh, M square uh, for each uh, wavelength, not each, but by step of 15 nanometer in the signal. And you can see that uh, we, we keep uh, the good beam profile for all the wavelengths. So here we measure uh, M square, and this is really good. But uh, really, this is good. And um, I, I found it uh, quite good. And here, this is a CP stability. So at 1.75 micron, you see it's 65 milliradians over almost four hours. Again, it gives you like 62 at a second resolution. Here is the spectrum. And if we move uh, at 2.8 micron in the same system, we had around 65. I remember, I don't remember the value at 3 micron, but anyway, it's quite close. We can read the same over eight hours, so the 3 billion shot, 110 at a second resolution. So, well, as a summary on this system, and I have to worry, I guess I'm running out of time. Uh, it's what is uh, nice, it's uh, you can, using OPAs, uh, you can uh, really have access to a broad uh, tunability. You have signal in either beam that are CP stabilized, and you can uh, operate at different pulse duration in the same system just by playing with a dazzler. Uh, again, if you do um, the FG between the signal and either beam, you can go up to 10 micron, and this is something that uh, we will want to, to do in the near future. Now, if I finish, I will book, go on the top right. Uh, I will just present you a source quite briefly at two micron, two cycle, two optical cycle, and also we see P stability. Again, uh, same kind of skin, it's white light, it's self-seeded. We do the FG, this is where we have uh, the uh, passive CP stabilization, and we use an OPA to control uh, the third order and the CP feedback, of course, and the dispersion of the pulses. At the output here, we have something like 30 microjoule. The pump is alpha, alpha millijoule. And this is, uh, this is the front end. So here are the results, uh, I'm gonna describe more. So you can see that this is a Whistler measurement at micron. You can see that you have a flat phase that uh, gives you something that is quite close, almost at the Fourier limit of the pulse. This is due to the fact that you can have also a loop in between the Dazzler and the Whistler. That's, that's cool when you make uh, your own uh, instruments, you can play with them. And uh, we also have 63, uh, 73, sorry, milligrad, so 77 at a second resolution. This is over, I don't remember, uh, 15 hours. So again, we uh, I, I show you that you can have CP stability uh, at two micro. Uh, also, something that is funny uh, to finish the talk is the fact that if you measure each pulses, you can have access to a lot of information. This is what I said to you, and this is true. For example, here, if you look at CP stability over uh, four hours, we saw some structure. So it's long-term structure, but you have to know that each second we extract the mean max value, the RMS and the mean value. And this on each channel. And for example, we measured the CP here, but we also measured the OPCP output. And we see same kind of structure. So we say, ah, interesting, but maybe this is coming from the pump. And yes, we have the same structure in the pump. So at the end, say, oh, that's really cool to have all these fancy tools in order to uh, understand what happened in our system. And at the end, we say, okay, look at the temperature in the room. And yes, it fits uh, perfectly. Uh, so the answer, uh, the, what you can extract from that, it's the fact that you can have also, uh, you can use OPCPA uh, for thermometer. It's quite expensive, but you, you can do it and we proved it in the slide. So to finish, uh, I hope in this talk, you had a better understanding of the OPCPA technology that it can work for different wavelengths range. Uh, we are lucky in our team, we develop different OPCPAs. Uh, uh, and I hope I prove you a bit that uh, yes, you can have tunability, but you can also have short pulses and you can have a good CP uh, control. Also, what is uh, cool with this OPCPA and the OPA process is you can go from 50 frames per second to 500 frames per second. So now I have to thank you for your attention and I hope uh, you enjoy this talk. Thank you.